So among the numerous topics I've discussed on this channel, Splatoon is definitely among the more popular ones. And with the grand festival of Splatoon 3 on the horizon, combined with the fact that I've wanted to make a ranking video for a while, I figured I can talk about one of the core aspects of this series, the story modes. While a lot of people would argue that the story modes in Splatoon games aren't the primary feature of the series, I believe that they're still incredibly important to show how the game's world has changed since we've last seen it, and I've always loved how fans have their own role in the stories of these games, as whichever Splatfest team wins at the end of one game determines the path the next game is going to take. It's such an interesting way of going about crafting a story that you have to admire the team's adaptability. And before I begin ranking these campaigns, keep in mind that this list is entirely my opinion, so if you think that one campaign deserved to be higher or lower, don't feel like you need to change that belief based on what I've said. I also may appear a little harsh on some of these entries, but let me say that I don't dislike any of them. I simply like others more, and I sometimes have to focus on the flaws of some of them in order to convey why I chose the ranking order. So without further ado, let's begin. Check out the copycat pod! Splatoon 2 story mode sure is just a copy of the first one, isn't it? Where every other single player campaign tried to do something different from the previous one, whether that's through the story or gameplay, the only real difference Splatoon 2's campaign has from the first one is that instead of Captain Cuttlefish going missing, it's Callie who goes missing. From there, you go on practically the same wild squid chase with the exact same structure as before. Though I guess this formula wasn't completely uncalled for since not many people owned a Wii U, so the devs probably wanted to give new players a taste of the first game. But that doesn't take away from the fact that if you're studying the Splatoon lore, you won't be missing much by just skipping this one entirely, as I'd say it's the campaign that matters the least in the grand scheme of things. Now how about stuff I like? The gameplay is just as fun as the first, maybe even more so as the addition of multiple weapon types gives players the chance to use different strategies and can even help them discover the weapon they prefer to use in multiplayer. The boss fights are super creative and fun, but the final fight with Octavia was honestly a downgrade from the first game, being way more constricted and with less stuff to do. In the grand story of Splatoon, the second game's campaign is pretty much a filler episode between everything else that happens throughout the multiple campaigns of the series, and it's a shame because it didn't have to be this way. Before Splatoon 2 was released, Nintendo posted a series of stories on their website called Squid Sisters Stories that tell of how when the final Splatfest ended, Marie's popularity quickly eclipsed Callie's, and as time moved on, they slowly grew further apart. It's a really interesting story with strong themes of growing up, the cost of fame, and how even the closest of friends can eventually drift apart. And almost none of that is shown in the game. There are a couple sunken scrolls that talk about it, but I wish there could have been more scenes or anything that dive deeper into the mentality of either Callie or Marie, as it would have led to a much more engaging story. This campaign had the potential to differentiate itself from its predecessor, but didn't seem to do it for reasons that likely have to do with the sales numbers of said predecessor, but at least it dropped hints of what was to come. Order! Order! Tape recorder! For me, side order is kind of the reverse of Splatoon 2. Whereas my biggest problem with Splatoon 2 was its story, my biggest problem with side order is its gameplay. Now this isn't to say it's not fun. Scaling the spire of order with no knowledge of what the next level could be like, combined with the fact that if you lose you'll have to start all over, is great and provides a feeling of tension unlike anything I've seen. The problems start after you clear the spire, where if you really want to beat this campaign, you have to do that 11 more times. And if that sounds tedious, believe me, it is. And also believe me when I say that the spire gets a lot easier after you've cleared it the first time, regardless of the weapon you're using. So much so that after a while, 
all the levels just kind of blend together. And even levels that you loved at the start, you begin to hate given the amount of times you have to go through them. And even when you complete it for a 12th time, there's no grand reward or final challenge akin to Inner Agent 3 or After Alterna, so it kind of feels like you went through that incredibly tedious experience for nothing, something that I was definitely not happy about when I discovered it. But while the gameplay of Side Order could have been handled better, I think the story definitely makes up for it. First of all, the characters. It's great to see off the hook again since they're my favorite idol group, and I think playing as Agent 8 again is a lot better than forcing in a new character out of nowhere. And while she doesn't do much throughout the campaign, I still think Oct is a welcome addition to the series, and I'm glad she ended up being an actual person and not some creation of the digital world, as that kind of twist has been long overdone. And the overall story of Marina creating this virtual world in order to help Octolings but eventually went haywire is really interesting. The fact that this world was built off of Commander Tartar's data really makes it seem like more of a follow-up instead of just a standalone adventure like Splatoon 2. In addition, learning that Agent 8 has been accompanying Off the Hook on their world tour and helping Marina with her experiments really makes them seem a lot more like an actual character instead of just a player avatar, something that I'm incredibly glad about. Overall, this DLC certainly has its flaws. I initially planned on putting it at number 3, but unfortunately, the incredibly tedious gameplay does hold it back for me. But despite this, it's still able to tell an engaging story that builds off of previous adventures while potentially giving us hints at what the future could be like. Could have been better, but also could have been worse. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Ah, the adventure that started it all. Out of all the single player campaigns of this series, I'd say Splatoon 1 is the jack of all trades, master of none. Being the first in the series, it didn't have anything to one-up, so we're given a fun, simple story with fun levels and fun bosses. And as I said before, the final fight with Octavio is infinitely better than the rematch in 2. With you constantly chasing Octavio down until you eventually corner him, it really does feel like you're using actual war tactics to defeat him. So the balanced gameplay and not so complicated story gave this campaign an ever so slight edge over Side Order, but it also deserves credit for how it laid the foundation of the Splatoon world and its tone. While on the surface, this world and its story may seem light and cheery, this campaign established the much darker and more mature undertone that stuck with the series ever since. Through what's directly presented to the player, the story of this game seems to be, Evil Octopi Stole Big Fish. But upon collecting the sunken scrolls, we learn a lot more about the world than what's presented. Like how Inklings and Octarians used to be close friends but became victims of circumstance which eventually led to war. Or how the defining event of said war was a plug being pulled from its socket. While that may seem like a silly joke at first, you can see how some Octarians might feel humiliated by it, and how miserable underground life would be as a result. There's also the fact that underground life has been rapidly decaying, giving more depth to the Octarians' decision to steal the great Zapfish. But one of the most interesting bits of information from this game was learning that the world of Splatoon isn't some fun fantasy world, but is rather meant to be this world that we all live in 12,000 years in the future after humanity has died out. That's such a dark and twisted idea for what's supposed to be a kid's game and I love it. Overall, while not the most grandiose or in-depth campaign in the series, it is arguably the most well-balanced, with fun gameplay and a deceptively simple story that laid the framework for stories to come and the tone that they'd have. And even though it came out on a failing console, it helped turn Splatoon into one of Nintendo's flagship franchises. Good on you, Splatoon 1. What's that? Hair? Hair? Oh, bear! Man, 
You guys have no idea how much I wanted to put this campaign at number one. I wanted so badly for this to be the campaign that ties everything together and gracefully brings the initial trilogy of Splatoon to a close. But as much as it does do that, Return of the Mammalians is also kind of a mess. And as much as I wanted there to be other reasons for that, pretty much all of the problems can be traced back to Deep Cut. I already have an entire video on this subject, so normally I wouldn't go into too much detail, but this trio basically ruins everything. The opening to this campaign is fantastic. Meeting Cuttlefish, who's now retired as captain of the NSS, initially thinking this is just another Octarian plot, but as you dive deeper into the crater, you both find that there's something else at play here. And then you see, what? Octavia was the first boss you fight? Oh my god, the rest of the bosses must be massive in scale and unlike anything we've ever seen before. Fuzzy Ooze appears, you fall into Alterna, meet the rest of the new Squid Beak Splatoon, including the new captain, you get ready and these three idiots show up. Why? They don't have anything to do with the titular Return of the Mammalians, and suddenly they're the center of attention, with the NSS almost completely forgetting about Mammalians until the end of the game, focusing instead on defeating Deep Cut and rescuing Cuttlefish. You're telling me I could have been fighting some twisted mammal experiment, but instead I'm fighting these Team Rocket ass losers? What a letdown. And the fact that Octavio has a change of heart at the end, while fun, is also kind of insulting. So Octavio had this whole character arc and we saw none of it? That's a cop out if I ever saw one. And while we definitely see the story I wanted through the numerous data entries collected throughout the game, it's the fact that we hardly see the characters interact with this information that really gets under my skin. While I praised the indirect storytelling of this series with the previous entry, I think this would have been the perfect chance to ease into more direct forms of plot advancement, since all the scenes we do have of characters interacting are insanely charming. So imagine if those actually had anything to do with the plot, it would have been a gold mine. But instead, we're stuck with Deep Cut as the villains until Grizz comes in at the end. In my opinion, it's an insane waste of potential. But don't worry, there's plenty of good here. I wouldn't have put this at number two if there wasn't. I love how the gameplay style is sort of a combination of the Octo expansion and previous campaigns, with missions being highly varied while retaining the island overworld structure we were used to before. It gives the impression that this campaign is utilizing every part of Splatoon. And I also love the detail of the sunken scrolls all being in the overworld, as it actually gives the player something to do in an area that otherwise would have just been used to move from level to level. And just like the first game, the underlying plot is fantastic. We already knew that humans had gone extinct in this world, but now we get a detailed account of it all. I'm not going to summarize it all here, but it's an amazing tale of hope, dread, and makes you think about what could happen after you're gone. It's an amazing story. But as said before, the biggest flaw of this campaign is not having the characters be a part of that story until the end. And that end, who boy. Getting to finally see Mr. Grizz after five years and discovering what Grizzco has been doing all this time was great, and is another example of utilizing everything about Splatoon, as what was once a silly side mode is now a core part of the world's lore. Very well done. And do I even need to say anything about the finale? While it was a disappointment narrative-wise, being able to fight alongside Octavio, who's pitching into the song that defeated him twice, really made it seem like he's come full circle. And Calamari Incantation 3 mix. That song alone should have put Splatoon 3 up for best music at the Game Awards. It's moments like that that make you think about how far Splatoon has come going from a light-hearted children shooter game to a giant kaiju battle in space. Truly peak narrative. 
as I said, I really wish I could have put Return of the Mammalians at number one, as the best parts of it are easily the best parts of the series. But unfortunately, it's held back by some very notable flaws that I feel could have been easily avoided. And before I end this segment, can I talk about something? Why doesn't Captain 3 talk? I mean, there's no reason for them not to talk. We even have the option to interact with them, but then Marie talks in their place. So why can't you just have Captain 3 say it? At least the Fire Emblem devs realized their mistake in making Byleth a silent protagonist and gave them actual dialogue in Three Hopes, so why not have that be the case here? I know it's such a small detail, but this really did break a lot of the immersion for me. I don't know if we'll ever see Captain 3 again, but hopefully Nintendo takes a page out of Fire Emblem's book and learns from it. All in all, really good campaign. October 8th is when we take the time out to celebrate a majestic eight-legged mollusk. The Octo expansion is peak Splatoon. I think this for a similar reason why I think Avatar The Last Airbender is a great show. Not because everything about them is spectacular, but because there's just very little that they do wrong. You may have noticed throughout this video I've been focusing a lot on the flaws of the different campaigns more than they deserve. But that's because I love all of them, and focusing on their flaws is one of the only ways I can set them apart. But with the Octo Expansion, I can't really think of any flaws notable enough that they take enjoyment out of the experience. So with that in mind, let's jump into the good stuff. This campaign feels more like a follow-up to the first game than 2's base campaign. While the base game of 2 deals with another incursion by Octavio, the Octo Expansion deals more with the effects that the first game had, and while there were hints about it in the base game, it's in this DLC that we learn that Octolings have been fleeing to the surface, but many of them get stuck in this underground labyrinth and are sanitized into becoming mindless drones. Now it's up to one of these Octolings, who's been dubbed Agent 8, to make their way through the labyrinth of subway tunnels and assemble the means to escape. Right off the bat, the new design of missions is great. Whereas before all missions were designed as levels, now they're more about completing a goal. That goal could be to complete a level, but it could also be to avoid getting hit for a certain amount of time, defend a ball, or make a sculpture out of crates. It adds a ton of variety to a system that was probably getting repetitive at that point, and I'm glad they kept it in Splatoon 3. And it's difficult. Out of all the campaigns in Splatoon, I don't think it's controversial to say that this one is definitely the hardest, a good choice for more experienced players. But moving away from the missions briefly, the characters offered here are also great. Where Deep Cut stuck out like a sore thumb, Off the Hook fits right in. The interactions they have with Captain Cuttlefish are both hilarious and engaging. The slow but steady buildup of Pearl and Cuttlefish realizing Marina is an Octoling is one of the most engaging plotlines in the series, and slowly panning down on Marina's former profile made me think, oh shit, what's gonna happen now that Pearl knows this? Only to see that Pearl doesn't think any less of Marina and that they wouldn't go through the cliche main characters splitting up trope was such a relief. And the fact that they don't define Marina by who she was in the past is a pretty powerful message. I'm sure we've all done things in the past we regret, but that doesn't mean we should let ourselves be defined by those regrets. And as Pearl shows, if someone is really our friend, it should take more than lying once to them to lose their friendship. Take note, Hollywood. And then the climax. My god, the climax. Throughout the game, it becomes obvious you're assembling a blender, but given what tech is like in this world, I thought it would have been some crazy vehicle or teleportation device that just looks like a blender, so it was a funny twist when we find out that nope, it is just a blender, and by the grace of Agent 3, we're able to make it out. What follows is an incredibly entertaining venture from this underground labyrinth to the surface that forces you to use different abilities in creative ways, 
and demonstrates that there's more to this facility than just the testing ground, as well as showing us that there are more evil forces at play than just Octavio. Fighting sanitized Agent 3 is a fun twist, and then the final showdown with Tartar is just mwah. Knowing that the city will be outright destroyed if you fail shows that the stakes are higher than ever before. I don't know if this was meant to set up Splatoon 3 or not, but it showed that there's more left of this ancient civilization than meets the eye. And unlike Side Order, it actually rewards the player for doing everything. I stand by the idea that Inner Agent 3 is one of the hardest boss fights Nintendo has ever made, and if you can beat it, you can say with full confidence that you beat the Octo Expansion. Out of all the campaigns, this DLC is just the most consistently good. I don't think its highs quite match Return of the Mammalians, but it also just doesn't have anything significant holding it back. I suppose if I did have a problem with it, it would be that the bosses are just harder versions of the main game's bosses, but I love a challenge, so I can let that slide. And through the consistency of this DLC, a valuable lesson can be learned. If you're a game designer or filmmaker or writer or any other type of developer, make sure everything about a project is good before making sure one aspect of it is perfect. It may seem weird at first, but it's exactly the type of thinking that put the Octo Expansion in the number one spot. So what do you think? Are there any placements on this list that you disagree with? I'm interested to see what other opinions on this topic there are. I've wanted to make a ranking video for a long time, and I'm glad I finally found a subject to make it work. I hope to make more of these in the future, as it was super fun to reevaluate a whole series and see what I thought of it. Hope you'll stick around for more. Until then, peace out.